Thanks for joining us for CBN News Newswatch. I'm Ephraim Graham. And I'm Lori Johnson. A stunning defeat for Iraq this weekend. The Islamic State terror group has killed at least 500 people and seized control of the city of Ramadi in Iraq. The bold offensive comes on the tail of a U.S. raid that killed a key ISIS leader over the weekend. Heather Sells has the latest. In Iraq's Anbar province, thousands are fleeing Ramadi in the wake of ISIS seizing control. Over the weekend, many headed to Baghdad, but were stopped at this bridge for security reasons. The UN says more than 100,000 people have escaped from Ramadi and the nearby area this year, as violence has peaked. The ISIS victory recalls a similar triumph last year, when the terrorists captured a third of Iraq, declaring it a caliphate or Islamic state. And this latest victory brings into question the Obama administration's strategy of reliance solely on airstrikes. The U.S. had hoped the strikes would effectively support Iraqi troops in driving ISIS out. The administration is winning praise, however, for taking out the key accountant for ISIS. On Saturday, Delta forces killed Abu Sayyaf, who oversaw ISIS oil and gas operations in Syria. This is not just another person. Their revenue streams are extremely important for their survival. Lawmakers from both parties are applauding the raid, saying the death of a major leader is a psychological blow to ISIS and an intelligence win for the U.S. It's just a better way to gather intelligence versus just airstrikes. So it takes guts for the administration and our military to put an action like this together. Nunez, the new House intelligence chair, back. is also warning that the U.S. must employ a strategy to degrade ISIS across the globe and not merely focus on containing it in Iraq and Syria. The strategy, he says, would take a broad view of ISIS, which is recruiting fighters from the West and North Africa. ISIS I describe as al-Qaeda 6.0 which is what Ambassador Crocker defined ISIS as. So this is really the, the sixth generation of al-Qaeda. And now the question is, how will the United States deal with that new generation of terrorists? Will it keep up its strategy of airstrikes, or will there be more calls for boots on the ground? Heather Sell, CBN News. Israelis were shocked this weekend by the second pro-Palestinian proclamation from the Vatican in less than a week. The Pope comparing Mahmoud Abbas to an angel of peace. CBN Middle East Bureau Chief Chris Mitchell has this story. Pope Francis canonized four nuns in Rome. Two of them spoke Arabic and lived in the 1800s when the Ottoman Empire ruled most of the Middle East. It marked the first time nuns from this region have been canonized. The Vatican is hoping to encourage persecuted Christians in the Middle East by making the Arabic-speaking nuns saints. But local Catholic clergy have politicized the event by calling them Palestinians, even though a Palestinian identity, people, or state did not exist at that time. The pontiff created a media storm when he gave Palestinian Authority President Mahmoud Abbas a medal. It was widely reported the Pope called Abbas an angel of peace. But according to the Italian daily La Stampa, Francis said, May the angel of peace destroy the evil spirit of war. I thought of you. May you be an angel of peace. His comment about Abbas followed a treaty the Vatican signed a few days earlier with the Palestinian Authority that effectively recognized a Palestinian state. That Palestinian state wants to divide the city of Jerusalem and make it the capital of a future Palestinian state, including the old city. But Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu says that will never happen. We will keep Jerusalem united forever under the sovereignty of Israel. For the first time in nearly 2,000 years, Jerusalem's old city and the Temple Mount were in Jewish hands. Sovereignty over Jerusalem is the most contested issue in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Many feel the more unilateral support Palestinians receive from Western plays like the Vatican, the more contentious the city will become. Chris Mitchell, CBN News, Jerusalem. Amtrak trains are moving south out of New York again for the first time since Tuesday's derailment that killed eight and injured 200. Investigators are still trying to determine why the train was traveling at more than twice the speed limit. They're also looking into reports that the train was hit by unknown objects such as rocks or even bullets. Over the weekend, Amtrak installed new speed controls at the section of the track where the crash happened. 
Today, police in Waco, Texas are on high alert after a violent clash between rival biker gangs that left nine people dead and 18 others wounded. Bikers from five rival gangs were meeting Sunday to discuss tur turf and recruitment outside a popular restaurant when the violence broke out. Police say, incredibly, all the people killed and injured were members of the gangs. I saw bullet holes in cars. I saw windows shattered out of cars. There are police officers' cars that have been hit. It is amazing that innocent civilians were not injured here. Police detained more than 100 people for questioning and also made several arrests. In an exclusive interview, Jeb Bush tells CBN News that we have to be unwavering supporters of traditional marriage. While Bush has not officially announced he's running for president, he's spending a lot of time getting ready, including a visit to Iowa. That's where he talked to CBN's David Brody. Jeb Bush would bring a big name and plenty of money to the presidential horse race, but he's already behind in the state that votes first in the primaries. His famous last name has led to little support in the Iowa polls. While he's not competing in the traditional straw poll, Bush says Iowa is still important. Are you going to be a serious player in Iowa? Yeah. What's what's the sense? Absolutely. You I'm, are. A, I'm a look. I'm a really competitive guy to begin with. <laughs> it's hard for me to imagine. Um, you know, I'm going to plan for fifth place. I mean, that's not going to happen. We're going to we're going to we're going to work hard here. He'll have work to do for sure. As a GOP establishment figure, he doesn't excite the Tea Party circuit. His support of comprehensive immigration reform and Common Core educational standards hasn't helped either. Something on display in Dubuque this weekend. And I understand that you personally support Common Core. Here's here's what I'm for. I'm for higher standards driven by the states. Common Core was established with 45 states voluntarily doing this with no federal government involvement. Bush's team is quick to point out his socially conservative past. As Florida governor, he championed pro-life causes like a late-term abortion ban and parental notification. He's also stood for school choice and tried to protect prayers at public school events. It's that Jeb Bush that evangelicals want to see emerge in 2016, yet right now he's fighting skepticism. The world we live in, people can get their own set of facts and make up their own minds without having maybe having all the information. And so voters came here searching for answers. I think he did a great job in uh, Florida and uh, we're here to learn about him, uh, you know, uh, and how he can be an effective uh, national leader. I'm kind of curious to see what he has to say about everything. I think everything right now is surrounded around the Iraq war and his brother. I think that's taking away from a lot of other important issues. Indeed, he tripped up last week answering about whether he agreed with his brother's decision to go to war. But in Iowa this weekend, he wasn't backing away from his family. Look, many of you all know me as George and Barbara's boy, for which I'm proud. Some of you may know that W is my brother. I'm proud of that, too. Whether people don't like that or not, they're just going to have to get used to it. And Jeb Bush hopes conservatives also get used to him defending traditional marriage in a day when doing so has political risks. They want a candidate eventually who's going to fight uh, on this issue. Are, are, you, are you their guy on this issue? Because they're, they're concerned about the marriage issue. Well, I'm concerned about it as well. I think traditional marriage uh, is a sacrament. Uh, we need to be stalwart supporters of traditional marriage. Do you believe there, there should be a constitutional right to same-sex marriage? Because that's the argument in front of the Supreme Court. I don't, but I'm not a lawyer, and uh, clearly this has been accelerated at a, at a warp pace. As has the religious liberty issue. So we asked where he stands when it comes to the right of Christian business owners to be forced to partake in same-sex weddings. Are you okay if they don't provide those type of services? Is that, is that okay? Yeah, absolutely. Right. If, if it's based on a, a religious belief. A big country, a tolerant country, ought to be able to figure out the difference between discriminating against someone because of their sexual orientation and not you know, forcing someone to participate in a wedding that they find um, goes against their, their moral beliefs. It's one of the many issues Jeb Bush will have to navigate if he decides to take the presidential plunge. David Brody, CBN News, in Dubuque, Iowa. The Southern Baptist Missions Board is relaxing its rules that block missionaries who believe in the baptism of the Holy Spirit. 
Baptist Press reports the goal is to allow as many missionaries as possible to reach the world. The president of the International Missions Board, David Platt, writes that the practice of tongues and or a private prayer language will no longer be an obstacle to serving as a Baptist missionary. But he states missionaries will still need to share Baptist core beliefs and cannot try to compel all disciples to practice any specific gift of the Spirit. Bible translation is thriving around the world despite many challenges. A new report by the United Bible Society shows that in 2014, more than one billion people gained access to the Bible for the first time. 51 new Bible translations launched last year in languages spoken by more than 1.3 billion people, including 1.2 billion Chinese speakers and 146 million speakers of other languages. Despite the persecution of Christians in Nigeria by both Boko Haram, the Nigerian Bible Society launched four new Bible translations, and in Liberia, the nation hardest hit by Ebola, two new translations were launched in languages spoken by nearly one million people. Nepalese remain on edge after two major earthquakes and a series of aftershocks destroyed cities across the country. The death toll has surpassed 8,500, making it the deadliest disaster on record to hit Nepal. But as Gary Lane reports, the dangerous conditions have not deterred Christian aid workers from delivering some much-needed relief. Fear and insecurity returned to Nepal Tuesday as another earthquake. This one 7.3 on the Richter scale shook the country for a second time in less than three weeks. And if that was not bad enough, a powerful 6.3 aftershock awakened Nepalis early the next morning. CBN Disaster Relief's Brian Scott is on the ground in Kathmandu. As soon as the earthquake hit, everyone screamed. Everyone in Kathmandu, it seems, was the loudest blood-curdling scream of terror and fear. Um, it was just echoing throughout the entire valley. It was like for about a good minute and a half of just crying out, panicking, because it was an earthquake in the night. Now in constant fear for their lives, many Nepalis are too afraid to go back inside their home. Many people are still sleeping in tents. Uh, many people are fatigued from staying up at night and living in a panic and living in fear. There's a lot of people actually leaving on buses going to the south of the country, getting out of the mountains and going down to where there's lowlands and flatlands. Many people have fled Kathmandu, but CBN disaster relief teams have not given up on helping the people, despite the ongoing earthquake risk. We have a um, cadre of around 46 staff that we're working pretty much day and night. We are actively uh, giving blankets, providing food, uh, doing medical care, and now uh, potentially uh, more than clean water. In the capital city and in remote villages, 80 tons of relief from CBN India is on its way. The first truckload arrived in Kathmandu on Saturday and was quickly unloaded by CBN disaster relief team members. The help includes wheat flour, rice, sugar, tarps, blankets, water, and other needed items. You know, the earthquake is not stopping us. Uh, just because the earth shakes doesn't mean we don't, you know, our relief stops. So we're active and getting out, making sure people get, you know, the people who are in, this, in the villages of Nepal are in greater need than those of us who have come to help them. We're working full time. We're trying to bring as much hope as we can, as much hope and help in the name of Jesus Christ to the people of Nepal. People like this elderly Nepali man who is now living in a tent because his home is unsafe. He thanks CBN for providing him with rice, blankets, and tarps to help him stay dry when monsoon rains begin in the coming weeks. It is our pleasure. Our God in heaven gives us the opportunity to give to you, for it is more blessed to give than to receive. As he loves us, we want to love you. Gary Lane, CBN News. It was a little degrading, um, I have to be honest. It was really kind of a, oh. Kind of a feeling, kind of my heart dropped out of my chest, like, what am I going to do now? Coming up, the attack on homeschoolers. Find out why these students are being targeted. More than a million students are homeschooled in America, and even if they receive an excellent education, they can still run into problems when they go to college. Charlene Aron brings us the story of one outstanding student who faced an unexpected challenge. When Jacob Berry finished high school in 2012, his next step was a question mark. 
I really was unsure for a couple of years about what I wanted to do. The 22-year-old later applied to West Virginia Junior College in Bridgeport, where he would major in information technology. During the application process, Jacob informed the admissions office that he had been homeschooled. After being accepted, he began taking classes, earning straight A's. It went smooth and everything was going great. You know, then it all long. changed. As part of a class assignment, Jacob and other students had to interview the school president, Sharon Stevens. During their meeting, Jacob's education became an issue. He was told his presence on campus jeopardized the college's federal funding. Stevens gave him 24 hours to present an accredited diploma, or he would need to take the GED. It was a little degrading, um, I have to be honest. Um, it was a little disheartening. I was like, well, I kind of proved myself that I've gotten a 4.0 in two of your classes, and you're making me take a, you know, a general equivalency test that is for dropouts. After failing to hand over a diploma, school officials pulled Jacob out of class and booted him from the school. It kind of felt like a freight train hit me at that day, and it was really kind of a... Oh. Kind of a feeling, kind of my heart dropped out of my chest, like, what am I going to do now? His parents, who homeschooled Jacob and his older brother without any problems, were shocked. I didn't ever expect to come up against something like this. You know, I'm, I just assumed other homeschoolers have blazed the trail and taken care of that. And initially, I was uh, taken back a little. Obviously, there was a little bit of outrage. Um, this isn't right. Um, they didn't give him an explanation, really, except that he needed a, a diploma that was certified. CBN News spoke by phone with college president Sharon Stevens. While she declined our request for an interview, she called what happened with Jacob an unfortunate but innocent mistake. She pointed out that federal funding regulations can be difficult to understand. She sees what happened as a much-needed lesson. I sent a letter to the college president, and I do this all the time. Mike Donnelly of the Homeschool Legal Defense Association says homeschoolers in West Virginia self-certify completion of a home education in compliance with federal funding guidelines, so they don't need an accredited diploma. Jacob has been reinstated here at West Virginia Junior College, but some say what happened here is just one example of the growing pressures faced by homeschoolers across the country. The college president called Jacob Barry and said that, that he could come back to school. Wow. So it's a great success story, uh, but it shouldn't ever happen. Unfortunately, it appears regulations for homeschooling vary from state to state and district to district. In Hampton, Virginia, families who homeschool for religious reasons must file a religious exemption. It requires the children provide a notarized philosophical and theological argument about their beliefs. This whole idea that children, separate from their parents, should get a notarized form saying what their religious beliefs are is, is simply well, we wrong. Homeschool advocates want legislation that provides protection from such actions. Back in West Virginia, Delegate Brian Kerchaba sponsored a new law that prohibits any future cases similar to Jacob Berry's. This came up right in the middle of everything. and. Fortunately, we were able to pass that legislation. Now the families can offer uh, the diploma. Absolutely fantastic. And the legislation also says that no state agency and no state institution of higher learning may discriminate. And it says treat anyone differently on the basis of their diploma. So that law would have helped Jacob Berry, but it will also make things much easier for homeschooled students in West Virginia Jacob's parents agree that the school's president was just misinformed about federal guidelines and hopes the takeaway from Jacob's story reaches beyond their state. Maybe it will have an effect on other states and other situations that see the unfairness um, of the situation for Jacob and it'll have a positive impact on for homeschoolers um, throughout the country. As for Jacob, he's happy to be back and is looking forward to graduation in May of 2016. Charlene Aaron, CBN News, Fairmont, West Virginia. Up next, biking benefits. Our next story might have you thinking about ditching your car and taking that bike to work instead. Stick around and find out why. As the price of gas rises again, more people are taking up biking as an alternative to driving. Mm -hmm. CBN News' own 
lifelong bike commuter Paul Strand checked out some of the reasons during this year's National Bike to Work Day. The addition of thousands of miles of bike lanes and trails in recent years have made many Americans feel biking's now a safer alternative. Chemicals released biking make you feel happier and less stressed. It boosts energy levels 20%. 56-year-old bike commuter Nick Bauer. And I get into work and it's just, you know, I feel great, you know, so that is a tremendous positive. I mean, I feel energized and, uh, you know, that, that's a great way to start the day. Beautiful morning like this. It just gets all the juices flowing. Um, I feel really relaxed when I get into the office after having a nice bike ride into work. Many people say the thought of showing up at their job all sweaty keeps them from pedaling in. Washington, D.C. bike commuter Mike Goodno says you can deal with that. It's not usually a problem, uh, only on the really hot days, but usually you can just slow down a little bit and dress appropriately and it's fine. Even if it is, a lot of offices now have showers. So why might you want to consider biking? What if I told you it could save your life and save you a fortune? First of all, the health benefits. In their first year, most bikers lose about 13 pounds, burning 500 to 700 calories an hour. What's that lead to? Well, heart disease is the number one killer in the world. Bikers cut their risk of heart disease by 50%. If every American replaced three miles of driving with three miles of biking every day, 300,000 fewer of us would die of heart disease every year. As for the money, you drivers pay about $11,000 a year for your transportation. Bicyclists, $350 a year. 11,000 versus 350. You drivers, you work about two hours every day to pay for your transportation. We bicyclists, we work about 10 minutes to pay for ours. Paul Strand, CBN News, Washington. And finally, here's a little motivation for your Monday. As you begin this week, I want to encourage you to push forward. And remember this, it is hard to move forward when you keep looking back at your past. And that includes not only past failures, but previous successes as well. In a circle of men, we've all heard friends and even ourselves clinging to the glory days of high school and college sports victories. And while that is nice, guess what? The glory days are not over. Your best days are still ahead of you. So press forward toward the mark of the higher calling in Christ Jesus. That is a good word and Thank biblical you. too. Yes, Paul indeed. says forgetting what's behind. You got it. Well, that's it for now on CBN Newswatch. You can find more of our exclusive coverage of the issues you care most about at CBN news.com. Make this a marvelous Monday, everybody.